This poster was created using just two images. And in this video, we're going through the process for how to design a professional poster. From the layout and typography to compositing the images and adding some visual effects. And whilst it's actually easier than you might think, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. But don't worry, in this video, I'm gonna teach you how to dodge these traps so that you can design a kick-ass poster. So let's open up Photoshop and get started. Rightio, first of all, let's create a new document and then switch over to the print templates. And I'm going to select A4 and leave all the settings as they are. Now, if you're designing for print, you can select CMYK as your color mode, but because I've got some punchy neons in here, I think I'm gonna stick with RGB. So first of all, I'm going to use the type tool to add some text, scale it up and pick a font. And for this design, I'm using Montserrat as the font and I'm going to start positioning the design elements on the poster. So you can see we have the name Blue. This is going to be the title of this fictional movie poster. And we've got good old Jimmy McJimbob who's going to be the voice actor for Blue. Now I'm making the properties of this font a little bit lighter. We're reducing the leading so those lines are nice and close. And I'm going to make the surname a little bit smaller. Nothing too crazy for now. We can change that later if we want and I'm just going to pop it at the top. Next Next, I'm clicking and dragging to draw an area text box and I'm going to paste in a bunch of credits and use the font due credit. And if you'd like to download this font, I'll link it in the video description. And I'm going to pop this at the bottom. This is where you typically find this information, the director, the composer, that kind of thing. And lastly, I'm going to use the paint bucket tool to fill that background with a gray and change the color of the text to white. And this is because the design of the poster is predominantly quite dark. So I want to create some contrast by using lighter text. Also, group your layers. So that's the basic layout, nothing too crazy in there. And now we'll just put this to one side so we can work on the poster graphics themselves. Yay, the fun stuff. Okay, let's open up these two images. I have a little robot character and I have some neon city streets. So first for the background, I'm going to select everything and go copy paste to get this into the main document. And if I switch over to the character, I need to isolate him from the background. So with the quick selection tool selected, I can now use the select subject option and do a more detailed selection. This can take a bit longer, but it's definitely worth it. Okay, let's zoom in nice and close. And then I'm going to modify that selection and contract it by one to two pixels, just so I'm cutting into the subject slightly. And then I can modify this again with a feather. I'll go for something very subtle like 0.5. And then I can add a layer mask to mask out the subject. And what this technique does is soften those edges so they look more realistic. Now I can grab the brush tool and pick one of Photoshop's nice soft feathered brushes, adjust the size of the brush with the square bracket keys, and then start to refine this mask. Select subject did a pretty good job, but there's a few bits that it missed. And using this soft feathered brush helps retain that more realistic and slightly softer edge that we did in the last step. And in my opinion, this step is much easier and more enjoyable with a graphics tablet, but here in this example, I'm actually using a mouse. So it is entirely possible, but it can just take a bit longer to get those edges nice and smooth and can sometimes be a bit Fiddly. So I'm just going to go around and quickly refine any of the areas that Photoshop's AI missed. Bit of brushy there, bit more here. And yeah, I think that's looking good. So let's go and name this layer. We'll type blue. Oh, it's like he's a real character. And then convert this to a smart object. This enables us to add smart filters, which gives us a lot more flexibility when designing. Okay, let's duplicate this layer and we'll duplicate this into the main document. Okay, so now I've got what I need from both those images. I can just close those down and let's name the other layer as well. And let's just hide this one for a moment and select blue and then use free transform to adjust the size and position because ultimately I'm going to be putting him in the street. So something like this I think looks good. Okay, let's bring back the street layer. Again, let's make this layer a smart object and I'll explain why in a moment. And now I'm adjusting the size and position of the background. And now I can double click the smart object to go inside it. And I'm going to do a bit of work on this image because this top bit here, this weird glitch looks like a bit of lazy AI art. So I'm going to use the patch tool to draw around it and then just drag that selection to an area that's clear. And just like that, it's removed. Now I can save and close that document and the smart object is updated. And now with that smart object selected, I can go to filter down to blur gallery and select tilt shift. This enables me to add a gradual blur to the background. So the streets up close are more in focus and those buildings and neon lights in the distance are a bit more blurred out. Now to find the right blur points, I like to crank the blur all the way up and adjust the position using the solid and dashed lines. And then once the positioning is all good, I can just dial that blur back a bit. Now this next step is absolute gold and will help you perfectly balance the exposure between two images every single time. So above all our layers, let's add a hue and saturation adjustment layer and drag the saturation slider all the way to the left, stripping out the color. Next, I'm going to add an exposure adjustment layer and then hold alt or option and click between the layers to add a clipping mask. And what this means is as I start to change the exposure, it's only going to affect the character. And as you can see, balancing the exposure, which is essentially the lighter and darker areas of an image is much easier now that we've stripped out the color. 
Now, of course, it's not always going to be like a perfect diagonal line every time you do this, but if you're new to compositing, this is a good place to start. So there we go, the exposure is now a bit more balanced between the two images, and now using the brush tool, I can go up to flow, and then bring this down to about 20 or 30%. And considering that the main light source in this image is coming from behind the character, I'm going to brush in a bit of backlight around the edges of the character. And what I'm doing is actually removing from the exposure adjustment layer, which is just revealing the exposure of the original image, which was of course a lot lighter. And once I've brushed around the edges, I can then go and fine tune the exposure as well. Okay, temporary hue and saturation adjustment layer. Thank you very much. You have now served your purpose and can go. And now I'm going to add a curves adjustment layer. And then if I switch over to channels, you can see I've got red, green, and blue. And red, green, and blue make up all of the colors that you're seeing on screen. So I'm going to hide the green and the blue, and I'm going to adjust the curves for the red channel. Now remember to add this as a clipping mask as well, so it only affects the character. But beware, by adding a clipping mask, you can see it's changed back to RGB, and unfortunately, I haven't noticed. And I'm only seeing this issue now that I'm actually editing the video. So I think I'm editing the red channel, but I'm not. And as you'll see in a moment, this does cause some problems. But anyway, if you're doing this yourself, the next step is to repeat the same process for the green and blue channels. And the goal is very similar to before. Essentially, we're balancing the exposure between the character and the background. And usually doing this across all three channels individually can very nicely match the color of your subject to the color of your background. But sadly, due to the aforementioned problems, it did not work in this example, which becomes immediately obvious when I switch back to RGB. Yeah. Now, in all honesty, I'd never heard of this technique until the other day, so it didn't really turn out as I'd planned then. So uh, yeah, maybe a bit more practice, Dan. But now seeing the image with all three channels, the red, the blue, and the green, it does make it a lot easier to make color corrections, and we can still use this. And maybe select the right channel, Dan. That would probably help too. Don't be too hard on yourself, Ginger. But even once you've turned the color back on, you can go back in and change the red, greens, and blues to try and balance the color of the subject with the background. Now, there's also another technique that I'm going to use that I'm more familiar with, and I'm going to use this to try and save the day, and that is adding a color balance adjustment layer. So let's add a clipping mask and immediately just bump up the cyan, and there we go. That <laughs> problem pretty much solved. And this enables me to adjust the colors for the shadows, midtones, and highlights specifically. And in all honesty, this is my go to way for balancing the color between two images. And this, along with adjusting the exposure, usually works well for pretty much any image. And now it's worked, we can get rid of that hue and saturation layer. And now we have balanced the colors, I am going to refine the exposure adjustment layer a little bit, adding some more highlights around the side of the character. Now we're going all the way to the top of the list and adding a solid color. We're going to select a nice punchy cyan, something like this nice and bright. Obviously, we can't see anything. So select the layer mask and press Command or Control I to invert, add a clipping mask. And again, we can't see anything. However, using the brush tool, we can now brush in some subtle blue highlights around the edge of the character. And this is going to simulate light hitting the character from all of those neon signs that are predominantly around the entire street. And I can also change the blending mode to something like overlay or soft light, which is going to blend that solid color onto the surface of the subject. Now I'm going to do the same thing again, but with red, because there's quite a few red lights in the background, but this one's going to be much more subtle. So let's select a reddish pink color, something like that. And if you hold alt or option when you add your layer mask, it will automatically add an empty mask. And now I can brush in some very subtle touches of red around the edge of the subject, particularly on the arms and the head. Okay, I think that's looking good. Now it's time to give him some eyes. So let's add a new layer and then select the ellipse tool. Click and drag to draw an ellipse. And then I'm going to adjust the position and rotation. And we can nudge that into place with the arrow keys. There we go. And I've actually got a really cool technique. So I'm going to duplicate this layer into a blank document. And I'll show you why in a moment. There we go, floating eyeball. And I'm going to open the actions panel. And I've got this amazing one click neon effect that I created in another video where you can literally turn anything like this white shape into awesome looking neon. It is pretty cool. And I'll throw a card on screen if you'd like to check out that video. And as part of that action, it generates a gradient map adjustment layer. So now I can go and easily change the colors of the neon. And there we go. He's now got neon eyes. The next step is to group everything together and duplicate this folder with our new neon eye back into the main document. Oh no, that's not confusing at all. Right, let's select the other untitled one and then click OK. We can now get rid of this temporary file. And if I change the blending mode to something like screen, I can remove the black and keep the neon. That's a nifty trick, that one. OK, so now we need to duplicate the eye and then flip this horizontally. And then nudge this over to the right. Excellent, he's now got a pair of eyes. Let's group those together as well, just to keep everything nice and tidy. Eyes. And now I'm going to add another solid color adjustment layer. Let's pick a nice blue, nice and bright. 
There we go. And for this step, something like screen or linear dodge would be best. And I can then invert that mask again and then bring the flow all the way down, something really low. And now I can brush in some glow. Ooh, nice rhyme, Dan. Nothing too wild, just a little bit of subtle glow coming from the eyes. And now I'm going to add another new layer, zoom in nice and close, and then create a new document with a width of 40 pixels and a height of four pixels. Ah, you're curious now, aren't you? Where's he going with this? So with the marquee tool, select the top half of the canvas, bring that flow all the way up to 100%, and then fill it with black. Deselect the selection and go up to edit, and then select define pattern. I'm going to call this TV lines. I learned this years ago and this trick is so awesome. So let's switch back to the main document and then go to edit, down to fill, make sure it's set to pattern. And then from the drop down, you should see the new pattern at the very bottom. There we go. And when you click OK, it will fill that entire layer with the new pattern. And again, if we change the blending mode to overlay or soft light, we get something like this. Now again, we're going to add an empty layer mask and then use the brush tool to brush this pattern back in, but just around the eyes. But instead of using a circular brush, we can actually squish this down into an ellipse and even rotate the brush using the left and right arrows on the keyboard. Now position this over the eye and keep clicking until that TV lines pattern becomes visible. And of course you can increase the brush size if you'd like that pattern to occupy a larger area. And now that's done, I'm going to name this layer and group everything related to the eyes in its own folder. And if we turn this folder off and on, we can see the difference those eyeball effects make. Okay, let's add another adjustment layer. This time we're going to select Color Lookup. This enables you to use LUTs, which is essentially a color profile. And there's some in here that are quite handy, like Horror Blue, for example. If I just dial back the opacity, you can see this has added a very subtle bluey cyan effect to the design. Here's the before, and here's the after. So that's the bulk of the compositing done. Now, let's add an awesome effect to the title. Okay, let's turn the text layer back on. And first of all, I'm going to select Jimmy McJimbob and change the blending mode to overlay. This is a really quick win and a way to get those colors from the image coming through the text. Next, I'm going to duplicate the blue text layer just in case I mess up this next bit. And again, let's convert this to a smart object. Now let's go to filter, down to blur gallery and select field blur. Now let's press backspace to remove that original blur and I can add a new one here. We'll just crank up the blur. And then I'll add one in the middle. We'll bring the blur all the way down. And then I'll add another one to the right with a similar amount of blur. Let's just move those a little bit further out to the sides. There we go. And then press return once you're happy. And then I'm going to add another new layer and drag this layer underneath that smart object. Now with the paint bucket tool, I'm going to fill the background with black and then select both of these layers and merge them together. Now let's go to filter, down to filter gallery. And from the texture drop down, I'm going to select grain. Now, first of all, I'm going to change the type to vertical, and then I can play around with the sliders until I get something I'm happy with. And just make sure you do drag that contrast slider all the way to the right so you don't get grain across the rest of your image, unless that's the look you're going for. Uh, this is one mistake that I made, but actually, as you'll see in the end result, I think it turned out all right. So with the effect created, let's once again change the blending mode to screen, and this removes the black background. And the last thing I'm going to do is really going to enhance the design. So let's select all, go to edit and copy merged, and then paste in a version of the design flattened to a single layer. Let's call this final, and then I'm going to right click and convert this to a smart object. Now go up to filter, and select camera raw filter. And there's a lot of settings here that you can tweak to do with color, exposure, highlights, shadows, whites and blacks. But if I zoom into the image, there's a few settings in particular that we're going to change. And the first one is texture. So if I drag the texture slider up a little bit and you can see how it changes the design. We can also bring the clarity slider up as well to, well, give it more clarity. And this can make the design look a lot sharper and as if it has more detail. Now, the last one I like to add is a very subtle bit of, whoa, too much, too much. Just dial it back down, a bit of subtle grain. And if I turn that layer off and on, you can see the effect it has on the design. And if I want to keep working on the design, all I have to do is double click the smart object to go inside, paste in the updated design, save and close, and those changes are updated, which means you don't have to do those camera raw filter settings every single time. And at the end of everything, this is the final design. And if you'd like to learn more about compositing images, photo manipulation, that kind of thing, you'll definitely want to check out this video right here.